Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So what you are looking at here is a still from a video of the 2000 to 2018 Sapphire Project review. Uh, this is an excellent project where they are trying to look at the electric sun model and replicating what that model would say is the way that the sun works. And it would appear that they've certainly achieved many of the observed phenomena from the sun and in this particular presentation they showed something very 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 interesting and they had this Langmuir probe and this was a simulation of what was uh, expected to be the temperatures at various points uh, as they were coming towards the anode and I'm going to let this play out and I'm going to comment on it and then I'm going to draw in some other data from November the 13th 1995 which is another person recounting the experience with a tungsten electrode and I think this is something that there may be some correlation so I'll just play this out I hope Montgomery Childs and the team at the Sapphire don't mind me for the scientific purposes to promote this but let's see what they say so so we did another model and this here what you're gonna look at here uh, right in this area here this is our analysis of putting in one of our probes and see what the kind of thermal response that we get and what the model is telling us is that the temperatures of the gas just off and around the surface of the anode should be around 23 to 2500 degrees celsius well within the constraints or you might say the the operating limits of tungsten which is what the tips are made out of a langmuir probe tips but what really happened and i'm going to watch you want to watch this video show you here what you're looking at here is the probe tip, and we're gonna play this video, and this is a very low power plasma. <laughs> so, <laughs> this don't. is where you say, now you see it, and now you don't. So basically they had the tungsten tip disappear and they went and got a higher specification, a thicker one, and that also had a strange phenomena occur to it. I encourage you to go and look at the video. The link will be in the description of this video. And they also talk about the fact that it was only 182 watts and that how can that possibly occur because there's a, obviously the temperature of boiling point or vaporization of tungsten is extremely high and they didn't have the oxygen in there one would imagine to cause the oxidation of it so it's really really interesting phenomena so some sort of plasma structure interacted with the tungsten tip to cause it to basically instantaneously disappear now I want to show you something else which is in a similar vein. So this is a presentation that David Hudson gave in Washington on November the 13th, 1995. And I'll play this now. Information play an important role in the process of spontaneous fission, where the two to one configuration connected with the second minimum of the fission bar barrier. Anyway, they're talking about all the shape configurations that occur when you get into this. Discovery of superdeformed rotational bands during the past years opened a new chapter in the study of nuclei under conditions of extreme deformation and angular momentum, and that superdeformed bands are populated at the highest spins. Okay, so one more, just re repeating again what I told you high spin, superdeformed, and they're interested in these because they spontaneously fission. Now, one thing I have to tell you people is we decided when I was doing the DC arc work, that, hey, we've got a way here to get it to metal. We bought this, what we call an arc furnace. It's a big furnace, about two and a half, three feet across. We brought it in. It actually has a water-cooled copper crucible sits in this furnace, and a big lid that shuts down on it, seals around it, and it has a tons of electrode hanging down in it. We put 30 grams of our white powder in there, and I said, you know, I'm gonna strike this arc, and I'm going to burn it for two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, seven. I don't care if it takes ten minutes. I'm going to burn it just like an arc welder, and I'm going to burn it, and I'm going to burn it, and I'm going to burn it until I literally cause these atoms to say, I give up. I give up. I'll go ahead and go to metal. 
so those are those, those of you who already heard this, I'm sorry, but anyway, I struck, I got this furnace in, pulled a vacuum, put in inert gas, there's a plasma gas in it. I got all ready, I got a hold of tons of electrode, and I struck the arc, and I went, and it stopped. Opened it up, and the tons of electrode was molten, totally gone from the machine. And I said, well, you know, there's got to be a, a malfunctioning electrode. This just can't be right. So I got another set, set of uh, powder. I put 30, mil 30 milligrams of powder in again. I sent for a new electrode. They sent me two new electrodes. I mounted a new tungsten electrode in it, pulled a vacuum on the system, got it all ready to go, put the inert gas in it, struck the arc, and went bzzz, shut out again. So what he's just said there is that twice he put into a tungsten arc furnace a small amount of energy, a small spark to try and get the ormus to do something and release the metals that supposedly are held within the white powder. And in fact, what actually happened was the tungsten essentially disappeared. Now, it's very interesting what he says next. So listen to this. I took it up and the tungsten electrode's gone again. Now people, if you add the BTUs of heat that had to be produced when I struck that arc, the BTUs of heat that came out of this machine is about a thousand times greater than the heat that should have come out of it on, based on the DC arc. There was no air, there was no oxygen, there was no chemistry. So he repeats, just like I said about the work of the Sapphire Project, there was no chemistry, i.e. there's no oxygen in there to form an oxide with the tungsten, and yet it basically disappeared. He's not specifically saying that the energy was calculated, he's, he's suggesting that the energy that's required to vaporize the tungsten uh, would be like a thousand times more than the energy that was put in to do the actual arc. And so he's saying something that's very similar as an observation that happened to him repeatedly well before 1995 on his journey that is quite similar to that observed in the sapphire reactor now of course the plasma is formed very very quickly when the arc is struck and so this is a much more immediate effect than the sapphire the sapphire was when it was lowered into a position where it was interacting with some sort of level of intensity of the plasma or that whatever was interacting with the tungsten was building and building until it reached a threshold in which it completely gave way. So I'm just going to play on from here and I think it's very interesting. It was literally coming out of the white powder. And it was So he's saying that whatever is happening uh, it's coming out of the white powder. Now you could argue that maybe it's something to do with maybe they had the same inert gas in there as the sapphire team did we don't know because we don't have the data on that and it could be some phenomena created by the electric arc that's going on so let's listen to him more it was about a thousand times at least more energy than should have been coming out of it and you know to melt a tungsten electrode the size of my thumb in a Okay, so this tungsten electrode was the size of his thumb. The original tungsten electrode in the sapphire reactor that disappeared, vaporized, whatever, that was a lot, lot thinner. When they went, as you will see if you, and I recommend again that you go and see the sapphire video, they got a thicker tungsten electrode and that didn't disappear so much, but it was changed internally and to a certain degree externally and basically became very crumbly and brittle less than a second just to melt it totally so within less than a second twice he repeated this thumb sized electrode effectively disappearing and made of tungsten the people who manufactured this melting furnace guaranteed it would work for 450 meltings <laughs> so they're saying basically 450 times the use of this tungsten electrode it should Guaranteed to melt whatever 450 times and it only lasted a couple of seconds, if that. I couldn't get a second out of it. I said, you know, this is this isn't right. Something's wrong. So anyway, I put the third electrode in it, I put another sample of powder in, I said, look, something's not right here. What if this stuff is radioactive? 
So we went, got a scintillator and I brought it in and I checked the stuff. It had no radiation at all. Now this was capable of measuring alpha, beta, and gamma emission. No radiation. And so I went over to the molten metal, no radiation. I said, okay. So I held it right next to this arc furnace. And when he struck the arc, tremendous gamma emission came out of it. Okay, so when the arc furnace is doing its thing and the tungsten is disappearing, he's saying that tremendous gamma radiation is coming out. Well, that's because he's got a scintillator that's looking and seeing potentially, he's expecting that the scintillator is seeing gamma radiation. Now, remember if you go to what Chalani observed when Rossi was uh, just prior to saying his reactor was turned on and he was about seven to eight meters away in another room and he had two um, sodium iodide operated, battery operated detectors. He thought there was an intense gamma pulse and he's a long way away from the reactor and it went full scale. And it was a very short momentary thing. So maybe something similar had occurred in the experience of David Hudson but he's interpreting it as gamma rays. It actually might be light of some type. It might even be gamma rays. But it's the next thing that he says, which is very, very interesting. Gamma is the bad stuff. Gamma is the really you know, powerful radiation. It goes through lead sheets, goes through brick walls, the stuff that kills you. And this just blasted it. Now, fortunately, it only lasted just a fraction of a second. It was all over it. And then we went over to our beaker sitting on the wall. And they're all full of bubbles and fractures and you pick them up and they fall apart. Beakers that fell apart. Now, what do we know from the lion experiment? I'm making an assumption here that these beakers were possibly ceramic, potentially glass or borosilicate or silicon dioxide. And we know from the Lion reactor that exotic vacuum objects can literally tear this kind of stuff up. And there are also experience of this kind of radiation coming from Leclerc and affecting things quite some distance away. And obviously, Ken Shoulders showed that you could get these things to bore all the way through alumina. And this was also something that I witnessed in 2015 in February, I think, when I visited a lab in North Moscow, where there was these holes being produced in a ceramic tube with Parkamov fuel inside and heated. And it made these minute holes everywhere where they demonstrated this gas was able to escape where it wouldn't beforehand. It was hermetically sealed. And so something was emitted that's able to basically shred the ceramic. And this reminds me also of the shredding of the plastic container and the partial shredding of a remote plastic container when I was looking at echo fuel. So let's listen to what he says next. We go to our wiring on our, our electrical system on the wall and it's all crumbling and going to powder. So the wiring on the electrical system on the wall is crumbling and going to powder. Now, is he talking about the polymer on there? If it's the polymer, well, then in the slow neutron detector that we had next to the echo fuel, the polymer sort of seal, the glue around that started to kind of like fall apart and so on. And so maybe there are some polymers that are more susceptible to this. And we know that Yuji Bajatov used some polymers as a partial shield to what he called erzions. But anyway, he's finding other things in his environment around this event, which happened, I guess, by this time, three times, that had been essentially destroyed with flashes of whatever it is. And this does remind me of the strange radiation instantaneous filling the entire lab report that I talked about in one of my recent presentations that was reported by Baranoff and Zatalepin and was the reason why they stopped doing nickel hydrogen experiments. Anyway, I'll let this play. I said, guys, we don't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually could be in the lab and call these the female elements that you do not force these elements to do anything they don't want to do. <laughs> 
Okay, so I really recommend you go and see this entire video in full. I would suggest that what is likely to be have been witnessed here is exotic vacuum objects coming out and interacting with other material when it had traveled from the arc furnace to some other place in the lab. And this is a very similar, in my view, finding to what happened in the Sapphire reactor. And when you see these instantaneous events, you do really have to question the thermodynamics there and to think about these things in a different way. Now, I have uh, some uh, white powder gold here uh, that was produced in uh, Hungary. I've had this for a number of years and I actually gave uh, a sample to seven different groups and, individual, and individuals at ICCF21 and not one of them have reported back. And uh, uh, I, this particular presentation from David Hudson was only uploaded very, very recently. Uh, it's the first time I've ever seen it and uh, I... Um, uh, it's, it's very interesting to have this finding in there that must have happened prior to 1995 that is very similar to that observed by the Sapphire experimental team. Now, he used much more uh, white powder than I have here in his uh, test, and so it's not something I can do, um, but maybe something can be done at some point uh, which is an analog to that, but given his experience uh, of uh, some sort of emissions, uh, which he thinks are gamma, but some sort of emissions that are coming out and basically sh causing glass and, and maybe metal, but plastic as well, to fall apart. And my experience uh, around echo fuel um, and uh, I, I really would be reticent to try it. And so how, how do we advance the thinking on this anyway? So there it is. Um, I would like one of the other groups to come back with their analysis before I talk about the analysis that was done on this a few years ago. Um, but what I can say is um, other things that David Hudson says um, uh, is, you know, um, I think, you know, what we observed comports with things that he observed. And so there it is. Um, I will give the links in the video description. Thank you very much for your time. And I will see you in the next video.